welcome to the SOAS podcast. Each episode we'll be discussing the latest in economics, politics and culture. I'm Isabel Edwards and today I'm talking to Professor Friederike Lupke and we're asking, are all languages created equal? So this discussion was sort of inspired by the fact that this year is the UNESCO Year of Indigenous Languages. Um, why do you think that we need to think about Indigenous languages differently from other languages? Um, well, the, the clue is really in the notion of indigenous languages themselves, because indigenous languages only make sense when you think of languages thought in relation to colonial languages or mm. more powerful languages. And uh, so that means there are languages um, that are not equal because the uh, people who speak them do not have equal rights. And that goes way beyond language. Mm. So, because it actually is related to the um, notion of indigenous peoples, which again, you become an indigenous when you're colonized. Because otherwise you would just be the completely unremarkable dweller of a place yeah. that you call your <laughs> own. So we're talking about colonization, imperialism, we're talking about genocide, um, we're talking about oppression and inequality. And um, that has had an impact on all aspects of indigenous people's lives, but of course also on their languages. Um, and so um, in contexts where the impact of colonialism is really felt till today, um, indigenous languages are the most marginalized mm -hmm. and indeed not equal. And do you think it's this, it's the fact that there's this perception from what's been enforced on them that they, they're almost a secondary language, it almost seems, with the, if, if there's an area that's been colonised, then... They are erased, actually. Mm -hmm. If you look at the US, their attempts to make English the official language mm -hmm. of the country, completely erasing the indigenous history of the United States. Mm -hmm. If you look at Brazil, um, Brazil is known as a Lusophone, a Portuguese-speaking country that completely erases the fact that there are hundreds of indigenous languages spoken by people who are still there. They still mm -hmm. speak their languages. And the recent policy of Bolsonaro is one to completely annihilate the rights of these people and tell them, you live in present-day Brazil, you need to assimilate. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's almost, I don't know if it's almost a fear of the that unknown that it's almost like if you have a language that we don't understand you have a sort of power that isn't there is that linked to it at all as well do you think i think fear um is very much linked to monolingualism yes so monolingual people have a fear of other languages because mm -hmm. they cannot control them they cannot understand them but <clears throat> this is um also related to to fears that go beyond language, actually, mm -hmm. that um, go, um, that, that actually are related um, to the fact that these languages and these, the groups that speak them, they are related to land, mm -hmm. indigenous land. And if we look at how indigenous languages <clears throat> came to be endangered in the context where they are endangered, and we see that um, this is not just caused by language policies, although they play a big role, but it's also fundamentally caused by land grab, mm -hmm. by resettling people into reservations, so completely destroying the language ecologies that have developed over time there, mm -hmm. and by actually turning them then into speakers of one indigenous language that can be pitched against the colonial language. And how do you think that affects your experience if you are somebody that speaks one of these languages and you're in an environment where there is another language that is more widespread or that has that more prestige with it? What, what do you think that's like as, as a speaker of those languages? Well, there's ample research that shows that uh, speakers of indigenous languages in these uh, mainly colonial s settlement uh, colony settings um, are affected by mental health problems, depression, they have problems to participate um, 
in wider society, in economic life, because the stakes are set up uh, against them. Um, and of course, they also suffer from their languages being completely devalorized and uh, not being taught, not being respected, mm -hmm. even as a language. Very often we find very um, pejorative terms, um, you know, this gibberish, these dialects. Mm -hmm. um, people are prevented from speaking these languages at school. Um, that's a recurrent experience that speakers of indigenous languages make. And um, on the other hand, then very often they are told you have to speak this language and you mm -hmm. have to, you know, preserve this language for humankind. So it's very contradictory um, what, what uh, speakers of indigenous languages are being asked to do. Yeah, and I think we probably, I think in the UK especially, there's this quite small minded view of the value of languages. And I think often we tend to think of it in terms of that like usefulness like is it going to be useful to you in business or how many people speak the language and it's almost like the more people that speak it the more valuable we we see this language as being but I think probably well, like you say it's, it's about having that connection to your roots and it's for humankind almost that we need to preserve these languages um well I like I'd like to get back to that a little bit later um so Talking about usefulness and the UK attitude to languages, you can't even say that it's um, an attitude that is um, driven by you know, the perceived usefulness of languages. Um, I just think that in the UK, this kind of monolingual fear of languages is extremely mm. pronounced. If we were talking about usefulness, you know, 75% of the world's population doesn't speak English. Mm. If it was about economic usefulness and uh, instrumentality of language, then every primary school child in the UK should learn Mandarin. Mm. Th that doesn't happen. What we have seen is, uh, particularly over the last decade, a 50% decline in the uptake of languages at school. Mm. So although primary school children are now learning languages in primary schools, this is completely under-resourced. But in secondary schools, despite the introduction of the EBAC, which was actually meant to correct this trend by allowing students to take a language up to um, their baccalaureate. Students can only take one language. Mm -hmm. They don't need to take a GCSE in a language. Yesterday I talked to a secondary school teacher who is now becoming uh, aware of the beauty of, of being multilingual. And she said, you know, I feel so terrible. I just completely messed up my French and my GCSEs because I didn't take languages seriously. Mm. I really thought, well, what's that for, you know? And I see my own students are not taking languages seriously. Um, and that is really striking um, because I think it's also related um, to a particular worldview mm. of fear. Um, that is, so on the one hand, you know, it entails, of course, linguistic insecurities. Um, when you speak with speakers of other languages, mm -hmm. you know, and you often hear British people say, oh, I'm rubbish at languages, mm -hmm. you know, Brits are just rubbish at languages. So that's, that's a sad state of affairs, don't you think? I mean, yeah. it must be painful. And from that pain, then comes this fear, you know, fear of languages. Oh my God, we cannot speak these languages. And then what happens then when you are actually a multilingual country with a colonial history, you know, that brought you in contact and brought actually, you know, people from your former colonies onto British soil. So there's a lot of linguistic conflict going on here. But I wanted to go back to indigenous languages and mm. the, the question whether we need to preserve them all. And I um, really want to emphasize something that this picture of endangerment and loss is not a universal picture. Mm. So we find many indigenous languages that are endangered. And as I said, that's particularly in former settlement colonies. So North America, um, Australia, um, parts of South America um, and of course European countries where you have mm -hmm. actually eradicated indigenous languages through indigenous um, 
uh, internal colonization or mm -hmm. nation state formation. You know, the UK has its own indigenous languages, Cornish, mm. Welsh, yeah. Gaelic, etc. Um, but there are other settings um, that have not been colonized by settlers who actually went and lived there. And so these contexts comprise most of Africa, much of South America, Melanesia. And there we find actually much more vital language ecologies. Of course, um, the colonial languages play an important role because in most countries they are the only official languages mm -hmm. and they are the only languages taught in the formal school system. Um, but in the shadow of these language policies, um, there is still a lot of uh, linguistic diversity alive and going on. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting to look at these settings as well when we talk about indigenous languages. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that there's even that difference within that bracket of indigenous languages. I think a lot of people kind of, it's like you say, it's almost this idea that they're, they're a less sophisticated language or that they're, they're dialects and they're not the true language of mm -hmm. the country. And I think actually, I'm sure that in all the research you've done in this area, you've seen that there's much more to these languages than an outsider might, might perceive. Yes, so um, from a linguistic point of view, these languages are fully fledged languages um, in all aspects. So they are completely able to express anything you would want to express. Um, they have very often extremely complex grammatical structures. Um, they some have complex tonal systems. Um, so there is no way in which these languages um, are inferior. What many of them don't have is a written standard tradition. Okay. Mm. And um, I think that is one of the main reasons why people, including speakers of these languages themselves, mm. see them as inferior. Mm. Because we have this idea hammered into our heads that a language, you know, is a language with a dictionary and a mm. grammar. A language can be written only in a particular way, in a standard writing system. And this idea is, of course, related to the creation of nation states. Um, what happened in the wake of the creation of nation states was that the linguistic variation of dialects and variable ways of speaking was erased and standard varieties of languages were created that then everybody was taught in mm. schools. Um, and of course, um, this ideology was exported in the wake of colonization to other areas. Mm. So that now very often speakers of indigenous languages see the only route towards being recognized as lying in standardization. And that is actually very sad because very often you have languages um, that are spoken by small numbers of speakers. Actually, mm -hmm. the higher linguistic diversity in an area, so the more languages you have, the smaller the numbers of speakers are. Mm -hmm. And so imagine you have a language that has perhaps 500 speakers, perhaps 1,000 speakers, and that then sees that it has to write the language and create a standard writing system. Now, that might be really important and successful for symbolic recognition. So, you know, this language is now a language in a box, right? A language that has its book. But at the same time, it um, turns its speakers into kind of guilty illiterates. Mm. Why? Well, first of all, it is extremely costly to maintain standard writing. As I'm sure you know, <laughs> you know we all <laughs> had to learn our so-called yeah. native languages at school in a lengthy process. And we have a very developed written environment for these languages. And even in Western societies that are very monolingual and very geared towards maintaining this kind of monolingual standard mm -hmm. writing culture, we know that many people actually struggle mm -hmm. with literacy. Um, so then imagine you are a speaker of a language that has 500 speakers, so though you are necessarily multilingual. 
and there is also going to be a much more powerful language and a more widely spoken language present in your environment and that's a language that you will learn at school or that's going to be a language that has a pre-colonial writing tradition that you may have learned and still learn and so then you are told that you need to write your language that has 500 speakers, yeah. most of whom you see on a daily basis. Who yeah. are you going to write to? Yeah. What are you going to read? Who is going to create the resources? Of course, it's true that um, there is a great inequality. So these languages hardly ever receive any resources mm. from the state. But even, I think, with the best intention to government, there is a real practical problem. And that is linguistic diversity is related to many, many small languages. Mm. So we need to rethink this, this idea mm. um, that, you know, you're a language when you are written. And if you have a language, the only way you can actually um, increase its value and uh, visibility is through writing. And I think also that stems very much back to the problems that we do have in our school systems where people are afraid to speak and they're afraid to give something a go and it'll be, you know, you learn the language by writing down your verb declensions and you learn it by writing down your vocabulary and we, we're obsessed with this. Written. Exactly, and this is so not the way to keep multilingualism alive. And it's really paradoxical um, uh, where I work in Senegal um, that children that are highly multilingual already um, when they start school. Mm. And then they learn school, which is a very traumatic experience because um, school is entirely in French, at least officially, which is a language the children have not been exposed to before. Mm. So they're supposed to learn literacy and numeracy in French mm. and learn French at the same yeah. time and French is not a subject of instruction and so they fail miserably oh, well not entirely because they're very very clever um, and then they learn other languages as modern foreign languages in schools and they don't do well and that tells you how absurd it is actually you know to teach languages in this formal yeah. setting so we should actually look at these other settings where people are effortlessly multilingual and look at how they do this mm. and it's through speaking observing being part of a supportive community mm. that is geared towards you know a positive attitude to language learning and it also means that you shed, um, you know, all these complexes and insecurities, mm. <laughs> you know, and people are extremely tolerant, you know, and there is not this notion of, you know, the unattainable standard of the native speaker, you know, yeah. or writer, you know. No, you, you know, you're encouraged, you can get away with a lot, you can improvise, uh, you can test the ground. And I think that's ecologies that really nurture multilingualism. And also through that, actually, you know, mutual understanding, cohabitation, connections between people. And so what is that, what your experience has been of learning languages? Because obviously you're mm -hmm. multilingual, you speak lots of different languages. How have you found, I guess you must have gone through a process of learning them by road at school mm -hmm. and then in your sort of working life you must have had a chance to explore them differently. Yeah, so my experience is actually one of you know, your standard average monolingual European um, <laughs> who learns languages through formal teaching at school. Um, and that was the case until I was in my 20s and I started going to West Africa and many of the languages I was interested in I couldn't actually learn at university or anywhere um, because uh, they were not even described and so I had to let go of all this <laughs> and find my own way uh, to learn these languages and that was actually a quite difficult experience initially um, because we have this perfectionism mm. you know it says you don't want to open your mouth before you've reached a certain level um, you can only you know be embarrassing really yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then I also had this experience of doing my PhD in the Netherlands and uh, coming to the Netherlands without speaking Dutch. And that um, is an experience that still haunts me because I was doing fieldwork in West Africa. So I started taking Dutch classes and then I went to Guinea and worked on 
you know, this tiny language uh, that I had to learn at the same time. And my Dutch phew, just went. And then at some point I just gave it up. Mm -hmm. Since then I have really great sympathies to immigrants who struggle mm -hmm. to learn the languages of their host countries. And I think they get so much bad press, you know, mm -hmm. they need to assimilate and they need to make the effort. It is so hard when you come to live in a country with zero or with very little knowledge. Yeah. Um, and you are supposed to function at such a high level uh, and the expectations posed on you are so high and they're also so politically charged. And the pressure that comes and with yes. what will happen if you don't learn exactly. this language. Yes. Um, so, you know, I think they really deserve more respect Absolutely. and support. Yeah. But so what what this all did to me um and then you know going to the field with my own son when he was um four years old and since then and seeing how he was able to just pick up languages and go with the flow and not worry when he'd forgotten them when we came back next year um that actually kind of set me free a little bit mm -hmm. and since then you know i also think I started thinking that the question that we always ask, like, how many languages do you speak? Mm. You know, oh, you know, you're guilty immediately because yeah. you learned Russian at school, you've forgotten it, you know, and your Spanish is now completely rusty. And I think it's the wrong question, right? It's a question that reflects this ideology that language is something that you have and you have to have them, you know, at utmost perfection. I think much nicer question is how many languages have you learned mm. and then because what I find what I see more and more as I grow older and I'm exposed to you know different languages all over and I can only master very few of them to yeah. perfection so it's like how many languages have you learned and I can say I'm not a speaker of so and so many languages but I have learned how to learn languages mm. and how to communicate yeah, and I think also, like, it's a very daunting thing where you're trying to become fluent in something. Like you say, you, you, you feel that pressure on you, whereas actually, I mean, my experience is just that learning language, and especially in the beginning stages, is so much fun. Yeah. Because you're exposed to something completely new, and it is that doorway into the culture of that language as well. And it's not as simple as, you know, you, you, you can only understand that if you understand everything about using the subjunctive and all of this. It's just... It should be something that is is fun to do. Yeah. I completely agree. And what do you think of um, so? How do you think we could maybe enthuse people about languages more? So I guess the whole the point of this year is to sense mm -hmm. raise awareness of indigenous languages. What do you think the ideal, I suppose, outcomes of that would be? Well, I think you know, for me, the ideal outcome would really be that we actually look um, to the people who are multilingual, so that we look at Africa, we look at Papua New Guinea, you know, mm. we look um, at the Amazon, and um, we copy some of the strategies mm. the speakers there use, this flexibility, this learning language through real communicative needs, communities of practice. Um, so that would mean, for instance, um, you know, if in your primary school um, you have many Turkish and Somali immigrants, well, why not teach Turkish or Somali? Mm. I know there's a school in Walthamstow that has a high Polish immigrant population and they started teaching Polish. And I think that's really great because for the children, they, there's something they can really connect with and then they can speak Polish and English in the playground and during breaks and they feel um they are valorized mm -hmm. and it's that pride isn't it that then you can share that, that you can share content. that you know at my son's uh secondary school at the beginning of the year before they were streamed into languages um the teacher invited all the students um to give a little taster lesson on a language mm -hmm. that they spoke and for the first time these students who are very often just classified as deficient in English, you know, um, should, could showcase mm. that they have this hidden wealth of languages. Mm. And similarly, um, you know, we rely so much on translation in mm. English. Um, 
And if you look what that does to our horizon, to our knowledge of the world, it's actually pretty terrible. Um, I think translation into English is maybe from nine languages. There are 3,000 languages mm -hmm. in the world. What does it entail? We have, tunnel vision we have a complete tunnel did. vision. Yeah. And so multilingual speakers, they have these multiple perspectives on the world. And so how can we achieve that? Clearly not, you know, uh, by translating everything. Um, but there are so many other ways. Um, you know, you can look at films that have subtitles. You can look at poetry performances that are subtitled and then just, you know, listen to the rhythm of Somali that mm -hmm. is there in this spoken performance and access the, the meaning, you know, in English. So I think there are many ways in which we can kind of weave more multilingualism in, into our lives that would enrich us all. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, yeah, something that we'll be inspired to do. And I mean, SOAS is such a great place to, to get that inspiration because there are so many, so many languages being spoken and probably, hopefully ones that when you were looking and you couldn't find those ones you want to study, hopefully some of those are available now. But. Well, a great thing is also that, you know, um, we have many languages at SOAS, but we have so many languages in London. Mm. And, uh, and there are many initiatives, actually, um, also by speakers of um, languages that you classify indigenous languages, um, who um, are doing things with languages. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, um, there is um, a program called Culture Tree that offers mm. Yoruba classes mm. to children uh, and adults. Um, so that Nigerians and people who are actually interested in learning Yoruba, uh, you know, can connect with languages that may not play such a big role in their current daily lives, but that allow them to keep these transnational roots alive. Oh, thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. what you what you've been up to and telling us why this is so important and I completely I think that idea of languages how many languages have you learned is such a nice thing to take away from that and think about in terms of we're not restricted we don't have to be put in a box of which languages we speak um, I think it's really important um, and thank you for joining us for the SOAS podcast if you'd like to hear more from us you can head over to SOAS blog or you can visit our website